All right, welcome. Thank you all for coming. We're going to get started. Such a pleasure to see you all here. Okay, before I get started, I didn't do this yesterday until like midway through the talk, and then I realized I should have done it at the beginning. But let me get a sense of your background and where you all are in your training or on the, on the, in this oncology space. So who here is in, who's a pharmacist or in the pharmacy side of things? Okay, a couple of pharmacists, okay. And who here is a uh, fellow in hematology oncology? Okay, a couple people. Who are any residents in medicine? Okay, anybody in medical school? No, okay. And then any faculty oncologists? Okay, and then where are people from? How many people here are from North America? Okay, uh, Australia? Uh, not, the, not today, yesterday we got a lot of Australians. Okay, anyone from Asia? Okay, uh, anyone from South America? Okay, and Europe? Okay, a few, okay, all right. So I have a sense of things, okay. All right, we're gonna talk about critical appraisal. And uh, I was working to change these slides because I thought that I would see some same faces as yesterday. But I think every single person here wasn't here yesterday. Is that fair to say? That's right, all right, good. So we're gonna do more of what I did yesterday. Okay, so let's get started. I think it's always good to give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I actually work as a hematologist oncologist. I'm an attending at UCSF. We have three hospitals at UCSF. We've got the county hospital, we've got the VA hospital, we've got the main UCSF, sort of the quaternary medical center. I work at the county hospital, San Francisco General. And I do that because I prefer to work there. That's a place I think you can really practice broad hematology and oncology. I have a panel of patients. I'm in clinic every week. I see everything from von Willebrands to myeloma to esophagus cancer. Um, and I attend, it's a county hospital, so many of our patients don't have insurance or are coming from different places around the world. Um, I attend on service where we cover, you know, seven days a week, about two or three months a year. I teach classes in epidemiology, primarily to the medical students and some master's courses. And we publish research papers from our lab that Allison, who's sitting back there, runs. Um, and uh, you can find all our papers on this website, BK Prasad Lab Publications. We try to make it available without any paywalls if you want to look there. In terms of conflicts of interest, I ha don't take any money from anybody who has a unidirectional profit motive in the space. So no pharmaceutical companies, no device makers, and I never have. Uh, I do consult on cost-effective care for Optum and Pathways and receive royalties from YouTube, Substyle, all the things I do. All right, that's my conflict. This is a talk about critical appraisal. So this talk is gonna be about how to read and appraise oncology articles. Um, are there anyone here who's listened to my podcast plenary session? Okay, a lot of people. Who here has heard me talk about polo? Okay, who here has heard me talk about censoring? Okay, all right, all right, okay. So you've all heard it, so we're gonna have to get to some things you haven't heard. Who here has heard my presentation at the FDA on MRD? Oh, really, oh wow. Yesterday's audience, they hadn't heard any of this stuff, okay. So let's start with the state of research. Let's get into it. So, you know, I wanted to start, I added a couple of slides because just today I saw something that was just incredible. I just want to remind us that we do have great drugs in oncology. We've got good drugs and we have average drugs. And let's just clarify which is which. Great drugs. This is a plot that came out of a JCO publication. This is the Swedish experience with chronic myeloid leukemia. So this is a hypothetical woman who's 55 years old who was diagnosed with CML in Sweden, okay? On this x-axis, it shows you the year she was diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia. On the y-axis, it shows her years of life. So she's 55, and in 1974, if she gets diagnosed with CML, she's gonna live how many more years? Three, four. Okay, so she's gonna die by 58, 59. The blue line shows you the same 55-year-old woman in the Swedish data set who didn't have CML, so this is called an age-sex-matched cohort, um, and her life expectancy is 27 years, you know? So the gap between the yellow and the blue is the years of life lost. It's how much life you're losing from having the diagnosis of CML. And I think if you're 55 and you get a CML diagnosis in 1974 in Sweden, I mean, it's catastrophic. You're losing so many years of life. Okay, fast forward, and something happens, and the years of life gap is completely closed. Completely closed, okay? Oh, one thing I wanna say. Why does the blue line go up over time? 
like, yes, in most Western societies, people live longer, except the United States for the last five years. We have a little opioid epidemic, a little COVID policy, COVID, you know? We're going downhill a little bit, okay, but mostly we go up. And the yellow line goes up pretty steadily from 1970 to 1990, okay? Then something happens and it really takes off and closes, okay? This is the year imatinib becomes available, okay? Now, I want to tell you that probably the majority of the, sorry, I want to tell you this is the year imatinib becomes available, then let me ask you all. Why does the curve start to go upwards in the years before imatinib? And I guess for the people who listen to me talk, you know the answer. Who doesn't know? Who has never heard me say the answer? Yes. Okay, good. But do you know, do you have a guess? See, good guesses. Okay, so I mean, that, this, and I think that's what most people guess, which is clinical trials. So absolutely, if you were getting imatinib on a clinical trial, it would have improved your survival. Imatinib was given on the clinical trials in the US and in Finland. You know, they had an early connection, but it wasn't given in Sweden. That's one point. Two point is the percent of people on a clinical trial is typically like two to 3%. And this is the entire population statistic. So it, to pull it up is a lot. And then the answer is for all the people who know what's the answer. I think the answer is that this is a year you were diagnosed. So imagine if you were diagnosed in 1997, 100 women. In 1998, maybe 10 are dead. In 1999, 10 are dead. And in 2001, there may be 70 remaining. Those 70 start taking imatinib and their life expectancy is so pulled up that it actually improves the years of life for people diagnosed in the years prior to the approval. Such a potent medication. But suffice it to say, this is all imatinib effect. It goes up in the years before, and this is all like, you know, improved CBC, like we're more opportunistic diagnosis and like better supportive care, and maybe interferon and allo, what we used to do. Okay. Then a few years ago, we talked about electinib in lung cancer. Electinib is used in NHL rearranged non small cell lung cancer, typically affects women in their 40s. Um, today we're talking about lorlatinib. We're talking about the crown jewel of this conference lorlatinib versus crizotinib. It started accrual in that study in 2017, the same year we knew that electinib defeated crizotinib handily for PFS. But now we're randomizing people to lorlatinib or uh, crizotinib. And there's a big PFS benefit and everyone is celebrating it. Okay, great. Um, when I think about lung cancer and the analogy, well actually, I'm gonna, I wanna skip ahead. I wanna show you the, the thing. This is what somebody says. Not to steal the thunder from the oral session today, but this is the crown PFS curve, more or less flat between 2.2 to five years and still 60% progression free at five years. Oh, it's flat. It's really, it's improved. Well, one of the reasons it's flat is look at the number of people at risk. It's quickly, you know, lots of censoring here on the tail. So I mean, there are tales and there are fairy tales, and tales are when you have lots of people still at risk, and fairy tales are when you, know, you have very few people. I think we'll see where it settles out. I suspect it will continue to decline very slowly. You know, it's not a cure. TKI for this disease is not a cure. They'll always relapse. Um, is it worth the side effects of lorlatinib to turn ALK into CML? This person is saying, we're turning it into CML. Are we turning it into CML? I took the same figure I showed you, okay? and I've recreated it for all the ALK drugs for 55 a woman, and this is what you get. All the ALK drugs still have median survival six years, seven years, eight years, you know, even if you give it that, you're still the years of life lost, the gap is still catastrophic. So lorlatinib, no matter how great it is in this PFS curve, it's no imatinib. We know there's a hundred percent of these people will eventually relapse. It doesn't have the durability of imatinib, you know? So I think it's a mistake to use that kind of false analogy. There's another way to look at it, which was done by David Benjamin, who here has heard me present this David Benjamin data? Nobody, okay, good. Finally, I'm showing you something you haven't seen. All right, so David Benjamin, of course, he's in, uh, you know him in the back, he's in, he's in uh, uh, Orange County, he's an oncologist. He was a fellow at UC Irvine, he came to me a few years ago looking for a project, and I was in clinic, in the lung cancer clinic, and I'd hear my colleagues say, good news, good news, I had a new lung cancer patient, metastatic lung cancer, the good news is, they're ALK rearranged. And I was like, well, it's, I mean, it's, preferable to be alk rearranged than, you know, non alk rearranged, but it's still not good news. I mean, good news would be if they didn't have the cancer. And they're like, good news, it's an EGFR mutation. Good news. And I was like, well, when you look at all the people in the clinic who have smoking-induced lung cancer, no driver mutations or RAS mutations, they're old, they've smoked a lot, you know, they look one way to me. When I look at all the people in my panel who have alk rearranged lung cancer, they're young, they're non-smokers, they're coming in with their kids, their kids are in the waiting room. You know, it looks to me like a very different population. So I asked David Benjamin to investigate this, 
and, he, and to look at, look at this. So here's what he does. The first thing he does is he plots the cumulative median duration of response. This is the duration of response if you take all of the TKIs in sequence. You take electinib, brigatinib, lorlatinib, crizotinib, seritinib, blah, 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 blah. You take all of them in sequence. And this is for HER2, for NTREC, for BRAF, for RET, for MET, for EGFR, for ALK, and for ROS1. Every single TKI and chemo in sequence, and this is the median duration of response. And you can see ROS1, you know, it's, like, it's, it's pretty decent, six years plus. He's also showing you the median duration of response if you have typical smoking-induced, non-driver mutation lung cancer, and we're talking about a year to two years, you know, something like we see in like Keynote 189 kind of situation. Okay, so this is why people say it's good news, because if you have one of these mutations, you have a much longer time on drug than if you didn't have the mutation. But I said, you know, again, it doesn't fit my eye of who's in my lobby, so why don't you tell me the average age with which they were diagnosed? And that's the blue bar. If you have NTREC, ALK, HER2, ROS1, this is the average age with which you were diagnosed with lung cancer, metastatic lung cancer. And if you have smoking-induced lung cancer, it's 71. And the orange bar is the duration of response after you were diagnosed. So everyone is celebrating that this orange bar is so big compared to this, but they're forgetting these people are being diagnosed 10 or 15 years earlier. And so to me, the years of life lost is still greater. So it's actually not good news. It's still sad and lamentable. And we shouldn't be saying false things like lorlatinib is the next imatinib. It's not. We should be aspiring for better drugs and different strategies because I suspect single, you know, one tyrosine kinase inhibitor is not going to solve this problem. Never has, never will. So this is what David Benjamin shows. Okay, on the top is US life expectancy. You know, you get the picture here. More life years still lost, even though the orange is better. And it's just the doctor's bias. The doctor only sees the fact that my patients with EGFR mutation, they come to my clinic longer. They're missing the fact that these people are way older before they ever had any problems in life, you know? And so I think it's fundamentally biased. Okay, so when I see things like this, I mean, don't tell anyone I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna go through ASCO and I'm gonna pull the tweets that I bother me the most and then I'm gonna screenshot them and then I'm gonna look up everybody on open payments and see if there's any link between them and the manufacturer. <laughs> I'm gonna do that. And I did notice something at the plenary session, I noticed that there are three drug abstracts. There are abstracts for uh, two AstraZeneca products and one BMS product. And 66% of discussants, not the presenter, but the person who's doing the dissection at the end, received money from the maker of the product. And that to me is like, you can't, you can't tell me you can't find a discussant who's impartial in this space. All right, well, we'll see what happens with this tweet. I don't know the answer. All right. I'll start with a little story. One day I was in clinic. Who here has heard me say this story? A few people. Gosh, you guys listen to everything. Why'd you, then you still came, so I give you, I give you hats off for that. Hmm. Okay, so a few years ago, I was in clinic, and I had a pre-medical student come to see me in clinic. This student wants to go to medical school. She's like a college student, and she's an artist. And after clinic, a few weeks later, she came to me, and she gave me this picture. She had drawn this charcoal on canvas. This was me in clinic. And I said, wow, that's really, it's really kind of very flattering and very sweet of this person to draw me. Um, and I really appreciate the picture and I treasure it. Um, but the, the student took a few artistic liberties with the picture. I mean, it's not exactly accurate. The first thing inaccurate is, in the picture I'm depicted wearing a white coat. And I actually have a secret, which I don't even own a white coat. I moved to UCSF five years ago during the pandemic. They never gave me a white coat. I don't even have a white coat anymore, I've lost them all. So I've never worn a white coat in clinic. Also shown in the picture is I'm using a stethoscope. And as an oncologist, I promise you, I've never used a stethoscope. My <laughs> only physical examination is a PET CT. And so this is an inaccurate, inaccurate portrayal. But you know, it's artistic, it's inspired by what happened. I'm also writing things down, I don't write down anything in clinic. I find it rude, so I just try to memorize what they say. And if I can't remember it, then it probably wasn't that important anyway. At least I tell myself that. All right, so I was in clinic. And the patient in clinic asked me a really interesting question. The patient asked me, hey doctor, I have metastatic colorectal cancer. Should I drink coffee to reduce the risk of dying? And I said, what the heck? And then she showed me this article, should I coffee prevents colorectal cancer? I said, oh, you know, I'm not sure about that claim. Seems a bit fishy to me, you know. I'm a big coffee fan, but preventing cancer? It's a tall order. And then I said, you know, 
told her what I always tell my patients, which is I always advise my patients nearly anything in moderation is fine. I wouldn't take up drinking coffee to prevent colorectal cancer recurrence or slow the spread of colorectal cancer. But if you're already drinking coffee as I, and you enjoy doing it like I do, I wouldn't stop. Okay, that's what I told her. That's always the right answer, right? Moderation is fine. Have some ice cream, have a drink. You know, even my patients with metastatic lung cancer who smoke, I've never been the oncologist to tell them to quit smoking. I feel like those oncologists, come on. If it were me, I might even take up smoking, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I feel like that's not, you know, we're not serving our patients that way. So I'd say, you know, do, do what you want to do. It's fine. I'm sure it's fine. Um, and she fired back, well, didn't you read the new study, doctor? You know, you're the doctor who says he reads all, reading all the time. Didn't you read that new study about coffee drinking? And I said, come on, me. Did I read the new study? Did I read that new study? Come on, I mean, <laughs> of course, of course. Of course, I read that new study, whatever it was. I'm sure I did. Okay. Here's the study. Coffee is linked to longer survival in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. This is the Harvard investigators from Dana-Farber. And this was before we knew they were photoshopping all their Western blots. This was back when we took them seriously. You know, they're, they're telling me coffee is going to prevent metastatic colorectal cancer. And then they also showed that coffee in the adjuvant setting, after you've been resected, get full fox, coffee has reduced colorectal cancer recurrence. That's a hell of a drink. Metastatic, yes. Adjuvant, yes. Even Irene Otikan hasn't done that. Really, it's done what Irene Otikan can't do. It's amazing what coffee can do. Dana Farber. You know what Dana Farber means in this town? It means the best. The number one. That's what they say, at least. They have the billboard. And <laughs> no, actually, the first thing they say is rankings don't matter. It really doesn't matter what rankings are. So what, what, what do we rank? We're, we're, we're number one. So actually, now, <laughs> today it's going to matter, but if it changed, it wouldn't matter. If it changed, but now it matters. Okay. And they put out a press release. It says daily coffee consumption is associated with improved survival in patients with metastatic Metastatic colorectal cancer coffee is going to do something. It's like 5-FU, Ireno, Tecan, Oxali, Platin, plus or minus Bev or coffee. That's the quiet, right? Bev or coffee. But I noticed something in the fine print that made me immediately know the study has to be bullshit. And here's what it was. The benefits pertain to both caffeinated and decaffeinated coffee. And there ain't no benefit to decaffeinated coffee. It's never had a benefit on any endpoint, and it never will. It never will. So I knew that was wrong. The PI of the study writes in the press release, we need to figure out precisely which compounds within coffee are responsible for the benefit. I mean, this person's already completely drank the, cool, the coffee and has believed it, and they want to know which, which flavonoid is it. That's the question now. I don't think that's the question. The question is whether or not these results are reproducible and have anything to do with anything, not what flavor of the coffee did that. Does it work in hazelnut coffee or French press? They're probably hard at work on that right now. I just, saw an S I just saw somebody put out, there's a ranking of the best scientists globally. Did you see this? The, the 500 best scientists. And it's based, on the, it's based on the Hirsch index, which is the number of papers such that you have H many papers with at least H many citations. And number one was a nutritional epidemiologist from Harvard. And that's when I knew the list was bogus. I just knew it was completely wrong. That's impossible. OK. So this was the paper, Association of Coffee Intake with Survival in Patients with Metastatic Cancer. And basically, it is a reanalysis of the CLGB 80405 study. Many of you know this classic study in colorectal cancer. They take about 1,200 people with untreated metastatic colorectal cancer, and they give them all a survey at baseline, and they ask who drinks one cup, two cup, three cup, and four plus cups of coffee a day at baseline. So this is a, it's a randomized trial, but the coffee question is an observational study using a randomized cohort, basically. And here's what they found. They found progression-free survival. When I see these curves for PFS, I think to myself, they all kind of look the same to me. I'm no expert. It looks similar. But here we have never drinking coffee, one cup, two to three cup, and four cup. But there's something that I missed, which was apparently a two-month PFS benefit is up right up there. And here's what you really needed to look for. The log rank is 0.04. Sweet, sweet 0.04. 0.04 gets you a paper in JAMA Oncology. 0.051, go to hell. Throw that right in the trash and get back to the drawing board. Get me 0.049 and I'm happy. All right, so they got it. They know, they, that's one thing they specialize at at Harvard, that p-value. Actually, that's an interesting study, p-value by university. Somebody, if you're listening, if I put this on the internet, somebody might actually do it. Let's scrape all the data from all the papers and look at the average p-value by university. I wonder if they're more likely to get 0.04s at Harvard than the rest of the place. Okay, overall survival was also better. 
you know, I'm quibbling about PFS, but you can't quibble with the gold standard endpoint overall survival, can you? Overall survival is better, and it is a, and, and it, four plus cups really does pull ahead. The reason, of course, four cups of coffee does so much better than, than all the other arms is because of this brief period of immortality that coffee causes. You see this right here at the two year mark, coffee makes you immortal for about four or five solid months. And that's when the curves really split. And that's where coffee, you need to figure out which ingredient in coffee and why that ingredient is timed to kick in at two years and one month and kick off at two years and six months. That's the real question. That's the only question that remains in my mind. All right, so this is interesting when I see a paper, when I see something like that. And look how thin the data is. So few people in this group, it's very thin. Thin means noisy. Noisy means that you get crap like that. It's hard to believe, come on. Okay, but there's an eight month PFOS benefit. Two months PFS have become eight months of overall survival. Seems quite remarkable. Eight months survival benefit from, from coffee. I started to look back through oncology drug approvals in colorectal cancer. This is Lawn Surf versus placebo, and Lawn Surf has a two month overall survival benefit. Coffee is like four times the power of Lawn Surf. That's how good coffee is. I also looked at bevacizumab for left side of colorectal cancer tumors, and bevacizumab has three months of OS benefit. So you can either have Bev or you can have four cups of coffee and you get twice the value of Bev. So to me, the, the amount of coffee benefit was quite large and striking. Uh, this is a busy graph, but it's here to show you that the hazard ratio is also better than bevacizumab. It's not just the numerical values, it's the actual hazard ratio is better. Okay. Coffee is way better than actual drugs, I noticed in this paper. Okay. But then there was a clue buried in the paper and the clue was in the subgroup analysis. And what it said was that sweet, sweet coffee works to improve outcomes if your BMI is less than 25. But coffee doesn't do anything if your BMI is bigger, if you're a heavier person. And this is a p-value for interaction, which means this is a statistically significant effect modifier, which means that the benefit really is driven by thin people. Thin people have the benefit. So it only works in thin people. They didn't put that in the headline. They didn't put that, but it only works in thin people. So I thought to myself, why would it only work in thin people? And one option is that it really only works in thin people. But to me, it smells spurious. It smells like where there's something fishy in this data set. And if you think about it, it might jump out at you, which is that if you have colorectal cancer, there's two reasons why you might be thin. One reason you might be thin is you initially weren't thin, but then you developed cancer-induced cachexia and you lost all this weight. You became cachectic and you decided you don't have the love of eating pizza or ice cream and you don't have the thirst for coffee and you start to become frailer and frailer and your BMI plummets. The other way you become thin is you were born thin. You were always thin your whole life. Now which of these two people, the cachectic, the person with lots of visceral metastases, colorectal cancer, which of, and, or the person who's like, you know, metastatic but four pulmonary lesions and they were just always thin, which of these two people really likes to drink coffee? Is it this cachectic person or is it this person who's always been drinking coffee? It's this person. So what I think the whole study is driven by is that thin people are people in whom coffee selects for <coughs> health because a thin person who doesn't drink coffee is probably somebody with a lot of the cancer cachexia patients are in there, right? So it's confounded. Coffee is a marker for having the vitality to have the thirst for coffee. You know, people who are sick with cancer, they don't love coffee, just like I don't see them drinking 10 shots of alcohol. You know, they lose the, the, the thirst for these sorts of things. Apparently nobody loses that at ASCO though. I see something different at ASCO. Okay, but so who drinks four cups of coffee? This person over this. And so that's what I think the confounder is. And the final point I'll make about this paper is that every substance on earth that improves outcomes in both the metastatic and adjuvant setting, this is a complete list of all the drugs that work in the metastatic setting and all the drugs that work in the adjuvant setting from work by Eddie Maldonado and I. And what it shows you is that 5-FU translated, um, you know, Zolota translated, uh, 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 Oxali translated, uh, but irinotecan failed, uh, panitumumab failed, cetuximab failed, bevacizumab failed. The only things that work in both settings are things with drug activity. Coffee has a 0% activity, and yet it's supposed to work. And so, my overall take on the paper, effect size is too large, that small PFS became a large OS that's inconsistent, the hazard ratio is better than actual anti-cancer drugs, a few random events and immortality drives the overall survival curve. Among thin people, cachectic people may lose the desire to drink coffee, no substance has a 0% drug activity, has ever worked in metastatic and adjuvant setting, and so overall, this has gotta be totally garbage paper. That's what I think. But 
How did I feel when I finished reading it? Did I feel like depicted in this picture? No, I felt like this. I felt quite angry. And I have photos of myself in every emotional state, so I could quickly find the photo for this slide. <laughs> I was ready to go. Oh gosh, too close, okay. Um, and I was angry because people who do this work make it harder to take care of patients, you know? So what I was gonna say, oh, uh, um, I mean, I think that we forget, but like, these are, these are Harvard scientists and other people, like a lot of people with like real credentials and a real day job, they do see colorectal cancer patients. Instead of doing any of those useful things, they're wasting all my time, they're wasting everyone's time doing this garbage. And this garbage gets media coverage, and then media coverage means the patient gets this crazy idea in their head, and they're wasting time in my clinic talking about this. So I've got a patient with metastatic colorectal cancer, and I want to talk to them about oxali neuropathy, and I need to talk about 5-FU and the pump, I need to talk about you know, decisions around BEV and cetuximab, but that time is being taken away to talk about coffee drinking, because these people would rather put their career ahead of truth. And to me, that's what I think it is. They're putting their career and one more, one more paper on their CV ahead of anything close to truth, and that bothers me because I don't know why they do it. And in response, the first author of this paper, who I don't know, tweeted this. They got angry. They got angry at me. It's an epidemiology paper. Okay, I, I got that. We carefully characterized findings as associations, not causes. We wrote paragraphs on limitations. Dr. Prasad thinks he's the first to know these things, and my co authors are right in the pocket of big coffee. And I say, well, I'm probably the first to figure out that thin person thing. I don't think you saw, you saw that coming. But um, I don't think you're being paid by coffee, but I do think the problem is, it's not personal, I don't know who this person is, but doing useless research, which I put a lot of projects in that bucket of completely useless, makes it harder to be a doctor, it takes our time, it makes it harder to teach the public about science. They come to think all science is a series of bullshit, and there are a lot of people who literally trust nothing, and it's harder to build trust in science, which has reached rock bottom levels. And so that's my real objection to this kind of stuff. Okay, good. That was all just to waste time, really. That had nothing to do with this talk. I just said that all so you could all trickle in. Now I get to the actual talk that I had planned. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do in this talk. I'm going to, pres I, you know, recently there was an FDA committee meeting to decide should minimal residual disease, which means after a, a treatment, a few months later we do a bone marrow biopsy and you have less than certain number of cells per a few million cells of myeloma. Okay, that's called, if you're less than a certain number, you have no minimal residual disease. If you're higher than a certain number, you do have minimal residual disease. FDA wants to know if we have a new drug that increases the fraction of people with MRD negativity, should we grant accelerated approval in the myeloma space? And they had a whole meeting on it and the vote was 12-0, yes, we should do it. And everyone who spoke said it was a great idea, but I had five minutes at the meeting to speak. And in five minutes, I made a few points about why I think it's a terrible idea. Okay, I'm gonna give the short version of what I said at the meeting. Then we're gonna do the whole lecture of this thing, wasting all your time until you get bored and leave. <laughs> we're gonna do the whole lecture, and then I'm gonna go back and do this again, and I hope the difference is you really understand why I said what I said when I really unpack all of the concepts. Okay, so here's what I said at the meeting. I said, listen, this is the actual slide deck. I said, we're here to discuss MRD as an endpoint in multiple myeloma, in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, and here are my points, number one. We can't forget, the goal of drug development is to grant marketing authorization, which means that you can sell it for that purpose. It doesn't mean it. drug approval. It technically is authorization to market it in patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma that results in living a longer or better life. That's the goal. We all agree, longer or better. Using MRD as an endpoint is problem for five reasons. Number one, and newly diagnosed multiple myeloma is not an unmet medical need. By statutory regulatory language, in order to use accelerated approval pathway, where we grant provisional approval to a product based on a surrogate endpoint, it has to be an unmet medical need. I'm gonna argue that it's not unmet for two reasons. Number one, the survival of newly diagnosed myeloma is currently terrific. In the Perseus study, DARA VRD versus VRD, the survival is 90 and 88% at four years, respectively. Okay, the median survival before this study was 10 years. The median survival of somebody diagnosed with myeloma tomorrow or next month is gonna be about 15 years in the US, at least a trial eligible patient, 15 years. So they have, long, they have good survival. That means that after they get initial therapy, they're gonna live with the consequences of that for 10 more years. Second, um, the second point, to be unmet medical need, there have to be no or limited treatment options. There are currently 17 different regimens in NCCN guidelines and 14 unique drugs. 20 drugs have FDA approval in myeloma. There's not an unmet medical need just because you have so many drugs. You can give DARA, VRD, KRD, you know, DARA-RD, you can give Cyborg-D, you can give VMP, you can give, you know, whatever. You have so many choices, so many drugs approved. 
type 2 diabetes with cardiovascular risk factors would be an unmet medical need by this definition, even though it has a similar, because it has a similar overall survival. So we could have accelerated approvals for diabetes and people with high cholesterol if they allowed this. Also, we don't use the side note, but we don't have accelerated approval for pancreas cancer in the front line, and we don't have it for CLL or follicular. This will be a unique exemption for myeloma, which has a median survival in between those two conditions. NCCN already acts before there's data. This is a figure by Mani Moyudin. This blue line shows you NCCN adding regimens to the list, and then the light blue line shows you when the phase three trial data actually came out. NCCN is already ahead of things, and NCCN recommendations mean Medicare has to pay to ARR, has to pay. Next point, MRD as the basis for accelerated approval would mean unsafe drugs come to market. MRD comes out one to three years faster than PFS. Novel drugs may be eligible for accelerated approval only 12 months after trial starts. Fast approvals means the drugs are active. They're active, which we'll talk about what that means, but they could be very toxic as well. For instance, CAR-Ts were given in myeloma initially in 2014 at the National Cancer Institute when I was a fellow. I remember them giving it. I used to think that doesn't seem promising, but it, it did work. But drug-induced Parkinsonism, which is a side effect of CAR-T, was only documented in 2021. It took seven years. Imagine if we use MRD for accelerated approval, CAR-T will have a higher MRD rate for sure. You'll give CAR-T in the front line and somebody's gonna have Parkinson's disease for a decade who otherwise could have just gotten DARA, VRD, KRD, and then got the CAR-T later, had the same overall survival potentially, and not had the Parkinson's disease the whole way with the ride. So my point is, teclistimab, Infection, 14% have grade three, four infections, but we only knew that two years after the initial dose. We didn't know that at the outset. Teclistimab will come to the front line very quick with MRD as an endpoint. Okay, so this is important. Safety is important when survival is 15 years. Next point. Progression-free survival does not predict living longer. The FDA used an analysis that said MRD negativity predicts longer PFS. MRD negativity in the same analysis did not predict longer OS, but MRD negativity predicts longer PFS. But then I showed them in analysis that we did by Mani Moyudin, PFS has a poor correlation with OS. PFS doesn't predict OS. Correlation coefficient 0.39, which means most of the variability in OS is not captured by PFS. Fourth point, surrogacy must always be at the trial level, not the individual level. They kept saying that people who are MRD negative do better than those who aren't. Sure, but that's not the question. The question is, do people, not, is not do people who achieve MRD negativity do better, they do, it's do regimens with higher rates of MRD negativity later improve overall survival, and the trial level correlations show that is not the case, they're poor. Most of the variability in OS is not captured by MRD, it fails as a surrogate endpoint by FDA's own statutory definitions. Number five, myeloma trials have very bad use of post-protocol care. In other words, in Maya, which was DARA RD versus RD, 51% of the people who progressed on RD never got daratumumab ever in the rest of their traje cancer trajectory. So DARA RD versus RD, there's an OS benefit, but would you have had the same benefit if you just gave them DARA on the back end? And the maker of this trial, Janssen, guess what they had access to that they could have given the control arm patients? DARA, because they got it making the thing, and they didn't give it to them. And so that trial does not answer the question the superior, in my opinion. This problem actually plagues all of the myeloma studies, and it has a big implication. Here's a paper led by Anushka Walia where we looked at all of the post-protocol therapy and all of these studies that move them up, and we asked how many of them don't report it, that's like half of it, and when they do report crossover to the active agent, what are the rates? And it should be about 100%, but it's going from 30%, 10%, 60% at best. We're not doing a good job of testing upfront triplets or quadruplets against sequence. We trust a quadruplet verse three, followed by when you progress, what do they give you, prayer and bed rest? I mean, that's not a fair fight. You need to do quadruplet verse triplet, followed by triplet, the US question. They're not doing that. What that means is that even if FDA watches trials to exclude a deterioration in overall survival, that's only in the context of substandard post-protocol therapy. Drugs could come to US market based on MRD that result in worse OS in the US market, but this fact will be hidden in global trials because of poor post-protocol care. The effect is canceled, negated, or hidden. So the FDA must ensure control arms are appropriate and post-protocol therapy is up to the US standard. That's the point I made at FDA. Finally, safety, this is the big point. The biggest concern of MRD is that you'll take people who are gonna live a decade or more and you're gonna give them drugs with inadequate safety profiles. A little Parkinsonism or neurological damage or pain or neuropathy will be catastrophic. You don't wanna live for 10 years with neuropathy if you don't have to. This population needs to be shielded from risk because they have the least to gain. The outcomes are good. Accelerated approval is for people who shouldn't be shielded from risk because they're dying very quickly. PFS actually, the current standard, gets you a little bit more time to identify safety concerns. 
OK, Whew, that's what I said. I think in that there are lots of concepts. The distinction between activity, whether or not drugs shrink tumor, and efficacy, whether or not people live longer, live better. There's also this idea of correlation coefficients, variability captured by correlation coefficients, and lots of other things. All right, so now, in the time we have, I'm going to go through those ideas and unpack them a little bit, and then we'll revisit these slides. And then we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. What time is it? How much time do I got left? Let me just check. 441. Oh, all right. Well, maybe we'll do some of that, because that's not going to go forever. All right. My favorite study. Is there anyone here who has not heard me talk about this? Even one? Oh, well, OK, few. You haven't heard? OK. And you in the back, where do your back are? You guys fellows, faculty, residents? Industry. Industry, OK, OK. That's good. That's fair. We got some industry people. That's fair. <laughs> Let me say this, I actually, you know, somebody was saying, like, you have something, I don't have anything against people who work at the industry, and I think some of the smartest scientists work at industry. Um, I think industry often has very high ethical standards. For instance, if you work for Pfizer, are you allowed to do consulting for Merck? No. Academia is the one that my problem has got the problem, because you're allowed to be the PI, the editorialist, sit on the NCCN, consult for Merck, run Merck trial, and then recommend whether or not Merck should be covered by NCCN guidelines. That's the conflict. I don't think working for industry is a conflict. The industry has a clear goal. They accomplish the goal. OK. Um, maintenance olaparib for germline BRCA mutant pancreas cancer. I remember the day I saw this paper. It was a fateful Wednesday, New England Journal. And I thought to myself, that title is really complicated. What does it mean? Well, I know what metastatic pancreas cancer is. That's adenocarcinoma. Uh, it kills 40,000 people a year in America. Once you have it, you almost always have microscopic disease, like Whipple's barely work, and if they do work at all. And uh, it's a devastating diagnosis. Germline BRCA mutation, that's the mutation that Angelina Jolie famously had. BRCA, a DNA repair protein, and germline means you're born with it. This is typically BRCA2, not BRCA1, a different BRCA. But they're born with this mutation. Among all the people with metastatic pancreas cancer, how many got the germline BRCA mutations? Maybe 7 to 12 percent-ish. It's not everybody. It's a, it's a small group. They tend to be younger than the average age. They tend to have slightly better outcomes because they're younger, you know? Just like I showed you with the alk rearrange kind of thing, that idea that they're younger but they have slightly better outcomes. Maintenance means you give them a drug when you otherwise wouldn't give a drug. To me, that didn't compute in pancreas cancer because I wasn't aware that there was periods of time where we would just watch it. I wasn't aware of that fact. Olaparib is a $12,000 a month medicine made by AstraZeneca. Okay, that's, that's Olaparib. And it's a PARP inhibitor. And PARP inhibitors work through the same DNA repair process that's implicated by BRCA, something called synthetic lethality. And I don't want to bore you all with that. Some, there's probably somebody here who's actually a scientist, and they'll correct me. So I don't care about that. But let's just say this is supposed to work well in this, theoretically. OK. My inbox was full of big quotes. This is my favorite part of the talk. Because <laughs> this is a real quote in a real newspaper about this trial. It's unbelievable, said Jose Baselga. It validates the principle we've been fighting for all these years, that even the most difficult disease, even the disease where you think you're not going to win, if you find the genetic vulnerability, if you find that, then those giants, they crumble. Wow, that is good. What a line. And you know what, that, that's, no, this is Baselga. He's the external, yeah, right. Well, it's good journalism to print it. He's the EVP of AstraZeneca. And he earned every dollar with a line like that, because that sounds great. So I said, giants are crumbling. That sounds good to me. Oh, this is a photo. Some of you, was anyone at this debate? AACR 2018? You're there? A very fun time. A very, what I like to call precision medicine, precision medicine debate. And was it a, it was a very fair debate. <laughs> it was a very fair debate. Okay, but we had a debate also. He's a nice guy. He's unfortunately passed away, but he's a, he was a nice guy. Um, polo trial. This is, my, this is my alma mater. I went to med school here, UChicago, the PI of the study. She said, when we saw the progression-free survival data, my reaction was a scream of joy. We finally made real progress in the treatment of subset of pancreas cancer patients. I said, screaming for joy. What the heck? Oh, wow. So whenever I read an article, I never read it cover to cover. I like to say, if you have difficulty sleeping, read it cover to cover. But if you don't, then you've got to have questions in your mind and find the answer. It's the only way to keep yourself engaged. So I ask myself, what did they do in this study? Is the control arm what you would do in practice? What was the primary endpoint, clinical or surrogate? And what about activity efficacy? So I'm telling you all this, so I'm going to teach you some things about PFS. And some, that's my goal of this. OK, 
So, polo. They took people with that germline BRCA mutation, pancreas cancer. They gave them the standard of care therapy, which is fulfirinox, or platinum-based therapy. They gave it to them for four months, 16 weeks. And if your disease did not progress, it didn't get worse, you were allowed to be randomized three to two to Olaparib or placebo. We could talk about this if you want. We've got some papers coming out on unequal randomization. But you're randomized to this or placebo. My first thought was, hmm, is the control arm what you would do in your practice? Am I commonly in the business of getting a metastatic pancreas cancer patient? I give them four months of fulfirinox. They're maybe 55 years old. And their tumor is maybe is starting to shrink a little bit. It hasn't yet met PR. Maybe it's 10% down. And then I say, you know what? Our work here is done. We're just going to stop and watch you and give you a sugar pill. And the answer is I would never do that because I'm not the worst doctor on earth. I would continue to give treatment, and I bet every one of these investigators would continue to give treatment in their practice. Well, I used to complain that they stopped all therapy and gave placebo, and then the PI of the study, or not the PI, somebody in the study, they fired back and they said, well, you know what, you're a stickler. We gave him four months of treatment, right, four months. Well, did you know the median number of treatment cycles for fulfirinox in the original Prodige study that led to fulfirinox's use was 10 treatment cycles, and fulfirinox is given every two weeks. So 10 treatment cycles is five months, and we give them four months, and that's almost the same. Almost the same. Come on. One month here, there among friends is no big deal, right? That's what they're saying. Well, I said, you know what? Hold on a minute. That's kind of a misleading comparison, because here's why. In the POLO study, to enroll in the study, you had to have no progression in the first four months. In Prodige, you enrolled at baseline. That means some people progressed in the first four months, and if you, only, if you progress in the first four months, can you get five months of treatment? No, you gotta get less, because you already progressed, you're off the study. So what percent of people progressed in the first four months? It's 33%. What percent would have been enrolled in polo? It's 66%. The median duration of treatment among somebody in polo is not the overall average five months, it's the average in the best two-thirds of patients, which I calculate to be seven months. Should be seven, not five. So you're giving about half. And then I said, wait a second, that's not 100% accurate because these are everybody with pancreas cancer and yours is germline BRCA mutants, which they do better. And I won't bore you with how I calculate using some percentile stuff, but basically I think germline BRCA mutant pancreas cancer patients, because they do better with platinums, they get probably about a year of therapy on average. And now they're getting a third of that in this study. So they're really getting shortchanged. What was the primary endpoint? The primary endpoint of the study was progression-free survival. And there's the old saying in oncology, if you can fit the laser pointer between the curves, you can give the plenary session at ASCO. And here you can fit five or six laser pointers handily between those two curves. It goes from eight to 7.4. I like to see that this is the tail at the end. This just tells you that not a single person is cured. You know, it's not a curative treatment. Okay. Is PFS a clinical or surrogate endpoint? Well, I say that depends on what PFS is. PFS is when we go through a scan at baseline, we measure a few tumors, usually three tumors, and it has a diameter, a cross-sectional area, and a volume. And progression-free survival is the time until one of several things happens, whichever happens first. It's composite time to event endpoint. Then the things that could happen are, number one, the patient dies. Number two, there's new lesions on scans. The tumors didn't get bigger, but the lungs were clean, and now they have innumerable pulmonary nodules. The tumor could get bigger. If it gets more than 120% bigger, it's called progression. If it's 119%, it's called stable disease. And actually, this number is not a magic number. If we have time, we can go through where the percents come from. But <coughs> nobody says, I feel good at 118%, I feel bad at 122. They're arbitrary. The tumor could shrink. If it shrinks more than 30%, it's called a response. And here we measure growth from the nadir value, the smallest it ever gets. That's progression. Whichever one of these comes first. Okay. So I think it's a surrogate endpoint because nobody feels bad at 72% and good at 69%. Nobody feels good at 119 and bad at 121. They're arbitrary thresholds. So everywhere in ASCO, they say the drug has a 42% response rate. All that means is of 100 people who get the drug, 42 of those 100 people had 30% or more tumor shrinkage. That's a measure of activity. It tells me the drug kills tumor. That doesn't happen from, you know, I don't know, acupuncture doesn't shrink tumor, and coffee doesn't shrink tumor either, you know? That doesn't happen from things that really don't work, but just because it shrinks tumor 30% doesn't mean you're feeling better necessarily. Okay, what about other measures? So I looked at this paper and something really jumped out at me. The response rate of 100 people who get the drug, how many have tumor shrinkage? If you take Olaparib, which is a $12,000 a month medication, that's 20%, and I completely believe that. 
one in five people has a tumor shrink on that PARP inhibitor. It's plausible. If you take a sugar pill, the response rate is 10%. 10%, one in 10 people have tumor shrink on sugar pill for pancreas cancer. You know, my patients always ask me, doctor, what do you think about cancer and sugar? And I always tell them, I don't know everything about it, but there's one thing I do know. Sugar pills don't shrink pancreas cancer. They are not supposed to shrink pancreas cancer. And here, it's shrinking pancreas cancer quite a bit, quite a bit of pancreas cancer activity, which I find odd. I'm an old-fashioned oncologist, so I like to look at overall survival. I know that's fallen out of favor these days. Nobody looks at that. I don't even think they presented it for Crown. I don't even see it for Crown. But overall survival was presented in the same paper, and look at those superimposable curves, p-value of 0.68. You know, even, even secutuzumab govitecan can't call that a trend towards significance. This is, there's no trend here. There's not a numerically improved anything here. No one can sell it as a trend. This is really as null as it gets. Okay. So how do you put it together? There's a PFS benefit, but no OS benefit. And sugar pill has literally done the greatest thing it's ever done in the history of sugar pill. It's just crushed pancreas cancer in one in 10 people. How did it do it? Okay, I'm gonna skip this. This is where they, if we have time, we'll do it at the end. Sugar pills shrink tumors 30% or more, 10% of the time. Is that typical? Well, in a paper by Ian Tanock, he looked at how often sugar pills shrink tumors, and the answer was 2% of the time, and that's just measurement error, an error in the measurement, but it ain't 10%. So does anyone know why it's so high in this study? Who hasn't heard me say it? <laughs> anyone who's never heard me talk about polo can tell me, why is it 10%, which is four times higher than what I'd expect? Hmm? You said prior therapy? Chemotherapy. Yes, chemotherapy. Think about it. <coughs> to get on this study, you get four months of chemo, they measure the disease, then they put you on Olaparib or sugar pill. Olaparib has shrinkage from here to here of 20%, of 20% of people have 30% shrinkage, and from here to here it's 10%. And the reason it shrinks is because getting pancreas cancer to shrink is like pushing a train down the tracks. Just because you let go of the train doesn't mean it stops moving. This chemo still is shrinking the tumor, even though it's been stopped. And that happens in 10% of people. So I ask you, if, stopping, if chemo that's not being given shrinks tumor 10% of the time, what would the response rate be if you just gave more chemotherapy? I don't think it'd be 10%. I don't think it'd be 20%. I think it would be way, way higher. And so here's a trial, in my opinion, where you halt a drug that's normally not halted and you randomize people to a new costly toxic pill or placebo. Deeply unethical study. You, if your mother was on the control arm and her tumor was shrinking on platinum and the doctor just stopped it and put them on sugar pill, you'd strangle the doctor, literally. I mean, I think you'd really be angry. And they allowed this, the IRBs allowed it. You measure an endpoint, PFS, that's historically not a measure of what matters and historically has never been accepted in, in can pancreas cancer. You don't need to use a surrogate because you can directly measure overall survival. You don't improve survival. Quality of life was not better. What does the FDA do with these data? What does the FDA do? And on the question of whether Olaparib had a favorable risk benefit profile, the ODAC votes seven to five in favor. It's on there. And the answer is, heck yeah. Heck yeah. I don't think heck yeah when I see results like that. So we wrote this paper where we said it shouldn't change clinical practice and the Netherlands actually have not covered, they, they had covered it and then they withdrew coverage in the Netherlands. So somebody listened, but nobody listened here. But somebody listened, okay. All right. So the purpose of that was to teach you what the difference between activity and efficacy, what response rate is, what PFS is, and what control arms, should, what we should look for in control arms. So now I'm gonna do real quick the 10 questions I look for when I read a clinical trial. One, if a trial does not have a control arm, like many abstracts at ASCO, all you're getting is a response rate. And this is the response rate of all the drugs FDA approved on the basis of response rate, it averages about 40%. The FDA has approved drugs with response rates as low as 12 or 13 or 14%. So in other words, if a drug Whenever I hear some industry person say, oh, we have a promising new drug, they say the clinical benefit rate, which is stable disease plus response, is 70%. I said, that's good. What was the response rate? Mm -hmm, 2%. I said, well, a 2% response rate drug is pretty much garbage and it's never going to come to the market. Okay, I mean, it's a useless drug. So you're hiding the uselessness with uh, stable disease, and stable disease is only stable because it hasn't had time to get to 120%. It's still growing, you're just getting it really, you know, you're getting a scan very quickly. Okay, so this is response rate. I look at that. But I also like to look to see what is the response rate of another drug that was already approved in that space? And this is a figure that Allison put together in a paper we published a few years ago where she took all of the drugs the FDA approves on the basis of a single arm study and she asked what their response rate was. That's the blue. 
And she also pulled the response rate of a drug that was already available to those patients, and that's the orange. And if there's no equipoise and no ability to do a randomized study, you'll see a very big blue bar and a very small orange bar, potentially. Like, that's what it should look like. But in many cases, the orange bar and the blue bar are rather comparable, which suggests that I think the FDA could have made them do a randomized study. So I always like to know not just the response rate, but you tell me the response rate and benchmark it against all the response rates in the disease. That's the first thing I look for. Second thing I look for, now let's say, okay, a trial is randomized. We did a randomized study. Well, what's the control arm? Are you testing lorlatinib versus crizotinib after you knew electinib was better? Well, in that case, I call it a suboptimal control. And we've studied in this paper in GEM Oncology, suboptimal control arms, we find they're about one in five of all clinical trials. This is a GEM Oncology paper from like 2018. I think we were the first to, I think Derek Tao and I were the first to write about this in the Lancet the year before, and then we studied it formally. Sometimes people talk about physician choice. We did secutuzumab govitecan versus physician choice. You have a total choice, complete choice, except uh, you're not allowed to give adriamycin and no platinum, uh, no TDM1, um, but you can free to choose whatever you want, except um, no docetaxel and no cabazitaxel, and, but anything else, uh, but except not those drugs and, and no abiratera and, and no enzalutamide, and, but anything else you want, absolutely have at it. You know? So the question is, do they give you a fair choice or a restricted choice? And as you see over time, for-profit sponsors have many physician choice studies with a restricted choice. This is like if I take you to a restaurant and you have to order off the, you know, the small menu, not the big menu. And what that means is I think they're omitting the most effective agents from the choice. So we get new drug versus the choice, but the choice omits the key, the key drug. I think it's a big problem. Real choices are very rare. They've been rare, but we have an explosion in physician choice, restricted choices. That's a way of gaming a control arm, in my opinion. The third question, power. I'll skip that because that's boring. Okay, crossover. You know, Allison and I were the first to sort of come up with this theoretical framework for crossover. But we hear a lot about crossover, and I don't think we always have a clear idea of what it means. When do you have crossover, when you don't, and what is crossover? So crossover in a randomized trial of a cancer medicine means you get randomized to drug or placebo. And if you progress on placebo or control <coughs> arm, you get access to drug. Another way to think about it is if you get drug and you progress, you get standard of care. If you get placebo and you progress, you get drug. Okay. The reason it's difficult to understand is there are situations where crossover is desirable and there are situations where it's undesirable. And you can either get it or not get it. So if you want it and you get it, and you don't want it and you don't get it, those are the good situations. But if you wanted it and you didn't get it and you didn't want it and you got it, that's a bad situation. So we actually get all four quadrants of studies in oncology. So whenever you read a study with crossover, you have to ask yourself, do you want it or not want it? You know, like voracitinib for the IDH glioma study. Did you want it? Um, did you really want it? And if you, and if you don't have crossover, you need to ask yourself, should they have had it or not? Okay. So I'll give you an example. Cipolucyl T has crossover. Okay, who here has heard me do the cipolucyl T thing? Oh, not everybody. I always do this one. Okay. Cipolucyl T has crossover. You tell me at the end if it's good or bad. All right. Cipolucyl T by Dendrion Provenge was the first ever cancer therapeutic vaccine. It's not, a, it's not a vaccine like a, like a viral vaccine. It's like we take somebody with prostate cancer, we suck up something out of them, we make a vaccine against their prostate cancer, and we inject them with it in the hope their body fights off their prostate cancer. And in the history of drug development, this has been studied hundreds of times, and only one has ever worked, and that's this one. It came to the US market, 90 grand for three shots. This was the primary result, overall survival, CYP-T versus placebo, and there's a benefit here, right? You can't argue with that. You can fit two laser pointers here easily. And I have a shaky hand, so that's pretty good. Four month OS benefit. But it has some weird features. One, it's the only vaccine ever in the history to be approved. Very strange. Two, it has a 0% response rate. Sugar pill is 10%, and this is 0%. It's not even as good as sugar pill. Can't shrink anything. And there's no change in PFS. It didn't even budge the PFS, but it made you live longer, four months. Strange. It like doesn't do anything. Like you inject yourself with it and it just doesn't want to, you know, it doesn't want to fool you. It, well, it doesn't do it. It just lies low. No effect. And then doesn't change progression, but then it starts working later. That's, that's what the have you believe. The study had crossover. So if you had prostate cancer and CYP-T, it had mandated crossover. So you got randomized to placebo, salt water, or CYP-T. What happens if you progress on CYP-T with prostate cancer? What would they give you? Docetaxel. 
a drug that's, saved, that's extended survival in every single study ever done in prostate cancer. And if you could progress on placebo, what do they give you? CYP-T. And only if you progress a second time do you get docetaxel. So it's actually a randomized trial of CYP-T versus placebo, but also early docetaxel versus delayed docetaxel. And if you look at all the stuff in the paper, you find 57% get docetaxel here after 12 months, 50% get it here after 14 months. So there's actually an imbalance in docetaxel, which is an actual life-saving medication in the study. So the AHRQ says, we cannot exclude the fact that survival benefits in the absence of response rate or PFS is actually due to harm to the control group from a delay in chemotherapy because they got an ineffective frozen salvage provenge. In other words, this was a trial where crossover was undesirable because you were studying the fundamental efficacy of Provenge. And by crossing people over, there may be a benefit to Provenge, not because it does anything, but because if you get it, you get it over with, and then you get docetaxel. And the other arm, they got to get it over with twice, two progressions before they get docetaxel. So I actually think Provenge doesn't work. And I'd actually venture to say that most cancer therapeutic vaccines don't work. I know that the Moderna has this impressive press result from melanoma DFS1. We'll see. It was a phase two study, small sample size, you know, lots of reasons. There's a lot of censoring in that study, which we'll talk about. Lots of people who got the vaccine are not being followed up. And I suspect we'll find out, but I, I don't put a lot of stock in cancer therapy vaccines. Okay. Meanwhile, what about Adora? Hmm. Adora took osimertinib, which had already shown a benefit in metastatic EGFR mutation positive lung cancer patients in Flora, and it gave it to people with stage 1B to 3A disease in the adjuvant setting. And that by itself is fine. The control arm is followed for recurrence. If the control arm recurs, they have metastatic disease, what drug should they get? Osimertinib, because we had Flora. And this study showed that only 37% of people with recurrence, or sorry, 37% of people with recurrence never got osimertinib when they recurred. They got a different TK or usually chemo. The, orange, the yellow bar shows you the difference in survival outcomes and the green bar shows you how many people didn't get appropriate post-protocol care. Shown another way, outcome uh, OSI, control, the difference, and the percent of people who didn't get OSI, who should have. And all I'm showing you here is that it's much bigger. So like any absolute survival benefit could have been accounted for by not giving the control on osimertinib. Like if you really have a stage 1B patient do you really want to give them Aussie for years on end when many are cured already, when you might get the same survival benefit by reserving it for the few people who have recurrence? This trial does not answer that question. And it's extremely costly. It costs millions and millions to give all this Aussie to everybody for so many years because it's so expensive. So this is an example of when crossover did not occur, even though the company had access to the drug. And it was desirable because it had already shown a benefit in a latter line and you were testing and moving it up front. Well, we, this is ubiquitous. Every time we have a study where they're moving drugs up front, they're not giving it to people in the back end. This is an analysis of that. Let me give you some examples. Um, Keynote 48, had in a cancer pembro. Uh, in the control arm of, of cetuximab, chemo, when you progress, half the people didn't get pembro. Well, pembro was already the second line choice in that case. Um, uh, Javelin 100, uh, when they progress on the control arm, they didn't get PD-1 inhibitor. Uh, Pembroaxi versus sunitinib. When they progressed on sunitinib, they didn't get Pembro. Uh, what else? Your, the Tony Chueri's Pembrolizumab adjuvant study. They, the control arm didn't get appropriate PD-1 on progression. Uh, bladder, urothelial, all these studies. The problem is they're not giving, their control arm is not getting appropriate drugs. And so they're saying, we found we're the first study to find a survival advantage compared against not giving it on the back end. But let me ask you, if you're living in a country where you cannot afford osimertinib for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, and you're running Adora, and Adora's positive, you think you can afford osimertinib for stage 1B non-small cell lung cancer? And the answer is no. These trials do not help the countries that they're running in, because they're running them in countries where they don't afford the drug on the back end. And they also don't help the US, because we are paying for the drug on the back end, and the trial does not inform whether or not giving it up front is beneficial to us. These company, the, the, the studies exploit both groups of people, in my opinion. Okay, so I always look for crossover. And Timothy has shown that like often, like the majority of the time when you look, it's substandard. And sometimes they don't tell you enough to let you look. Okay, question five. Yes? I can't hear you, sorry, it'll be louder.
For which, for, what was it last? I couldn't hear this. The example, the, the example for Andorra, for Catania, I think has been for earlier lines, it's easier to understand why it was not included. But for the Parsifal, you are. Sipti, yeah. Yeah, uh, you, are, you are analyzing the perspective. I see. Now you are seeing that they received those tax help later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, how, how do you respond? I see, I see, to okay. I would. Okay, yeah. So I would say that, like, you know, in my book I have a chapter, but like basically, anytime you have a new drug, the way to develop it is the following. First, you go to people, you don't go to the front line initially. You don't go to the front line for many reasons. One is that survival outcomes are longer, it's not the most vulnerable population. Um, you go to the second or third line first. You run your trial in your second or third line, CIPT versus placebo, clean study. And then you try to move it forward where you randomize people to getting it early or getting it late. Uh, the other example is voracidinib for IDH mutant glio, glioma where they cross people over and then everyone ends up on the study drug. The short answer is, if you have never established the efficacy of the drug in any setting, you should not have crossover. If the drug has never been on the market, it's not used in any setting, you shouldn't cross people over. You should do a clean study, drug versus placebo, and see if there's better results. Or drug versus best available care, drug plus best available care versus best available care. Sometimes that's placebo, but not always. The principle of crossover is, if it's shown benefit in the latter line, you have to do it. And if it hasn't, you shouldn't do it because it can muddy the waters, confound the estimates. So remember, I showed you about PFS. Well, whenever I look at PFS, I always look at it depending on the tumor. You know? So for instance, in colorectal cancer, cytotoxic drugs, drugs that improve DFS do improve OS. And the way you look at that is something called a correlation coefficient. That's what we're looking at here. So when I presented that MRD slide, what this plot is basically, every single dot is one study in newly diagnosed myeloma. Every single dot is one trial. The size of the circle is proportionate to the sample size of the study. And every trial has a hazard ratio for PFS and a hazard ratio for overall survival. And this plot is literally showing you what percent of the variability in the hazard ratio for overall survival is captured by progression-free survival. In other words, if PFS is a very good surrogate, the R squared should be like 0.9 or 0.8, meaning that 90%, 80% of survival is accounted for by knowing <coughs> progression. But if you only account for 40% of survival estimates, it's very possible that you have drugs, this is one, that have favorable PFS but actually have harmful OS. You know, that's what is possible, that it doesn't correlate at all, that you'll get these errors of both kinds. And you'll have drugs that might have had a favorable OS that actually have, you know, null PFS, which we see sometimes with immunotherapy. So to validate a surrogate, you need many, many data points on this. When FDA looked at this for MRD and overall survival, they found with very scant data points, they found no correlation at all, piss poor correlation. Okay, quality of life. Mm. For the sake of time, I'll skip. I'll skip the drug dosing. You can read it. We have a paper in the drug development letter where we go through all 10. OK, I want to do the censoring, and then we'll stop. Censoring. OK, this is the last bit, and then I'll come back to it. All right, so you know, you've all seen Kaplan-Meier plots a million times. Who here has heard me talk, do this part, the talk on censoring? Gosh, OK, just a few people. OK, oh, you saw this video. Okay. So we've all seen these Kaplan-Meier plots. Now, what do you see in this plot? Every time the curve goes down, it means somebody had the event of interest. Here, the event of interest is survival, how long you live. And so when it goes from here to here, what happened? It means somebody died. How many people do you think died right at this thing? Spot. One person. There are four people at risk. One person dies, so the curve actually probably goes down 25% towards the baseline. The numbers at risk are the number of people in whom you have still followed that far out and they haven't had the event of interest. And then if anyone has the event, they average the event amongst the number of people at risk. The larger steps at the end of the curve and the smoothness in the beginning is just because fewer people are at risk. So if anything bad happens to Bill, they average that for everybody. There's only four people and the Kaplan-Meier curve is an estimate of what might happen if all these people who just joined the study actually lived so long that they got out to where Bill and Tom and Sue are. Mary is, you know, the four people here. Vertical ticks mean that a patient is censored, meaning we don't know what happened to them beyond that time point. And the estimate of survival beyond the ticks is the average in people in whom we know what happened to them. That's the basics of the plot. So it's actually something called maximum information harvesting. 
We're collecting as much information from the data set as we can. And the key assumption is uninformative censoring, meaning the people here at the end of the curve who enrolled many, many years ago, that they're no different than the people who enrolled very early on. You know? Or sorry, very recently. These people enrolled recently, these people enrolled many years ago, that these are all similar people. And the people who are missing and the people we follow are all, there's no reason they're missing other than randomness. That's the uninformative censoring part. Okay, overall survival curves are smooth and PFS curves are sta stair-stepped. Does anyone know why a PFS curve is stair-stepped? Why do they have these steps? That's when you do the scans. Okay, now imagine a randomized trial. When we open a randomized control trial, let's say our sample size is 500, do we get 500 people on day one ready to be randomized? No. We typically randomize like seven the first month, 12 the second month, and then 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Actually, we studied this in a paper by Christine Janai. Merck randomizes 40, 40, 40, 40. Pfizer's like 32, 32, 32. Every company has their own number. And I think Merck was the winner. Like each company builds a machine that can randomize 40, 40, 40, 40 people a month. And actually, it doesn't matter if a tumor is very common or rare. The machine will keep randomizing at 40. Frequency of the tumor in the population is not a, it does not determine the rate of accrual. So we put seven people, 12 people, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Eventually we get to 500 people. We have enough. We start following them and we take the first look at the data here. The person who enrolled on the study here, who's still doing well, we got one year follow-up, two year follow-up and some change. But the person who enrolled only three weeks ago, we don't know what happened to them in 2018, 19, so they only have a few weeks of follow-up. And that's why we have to censor them. We don't know what happened to them in the future. But we can assume that the person who enrolled in 2015, whatever happens to them, this person's gonna have the same probability of events in the future, and that's the assumption of the method. So what are the reasons why someone is censored? For overall survival, it's because they enrolled recently or we lost track of them. For PFS, it's because they enrolled recently, we lost track of them, or a third reason. What's the third thing that happens in PFS censoring that doesn't happen for OS? Yeah, they didn't come for the scan. The tumor couldn't be assessed. What do you need for PFS you don't need for OS? This. If you miss one of these, you're going to get knocked off the PFS. But you can still come back. We can still follow you for OS. So remember, PFS is this thing. OK. So a few years ago, I was reading this paper by Jose Basaga. It's called Bolero. It's Everlimus, which is a very toxic drug, a drug from hell, plus exemestane versus exemestane in hormone receptor positive breast cancer. As Baselga. Here's the result. Look at that big PFS benefit, hazard ratio 0.43. I don't know what a hazard ratio is, but I know that's good. That's what the KOLs say. I don't know what it is, but I know it's good. <laughs> and uh, it is good. Look at that. It looks good. It's a big hazard ratio. Something going on here. Look at that. Very nice. Three to six. It gets approval. But I'm an old-fashioned doctor, I like to look at overall survival, and overall survival came out later and it was P of 0.1426, non-significant OS. What the heck happened? Why does this happen? How does a drug have a PFS benefit, no OS benefit? Well, the company ha likes to say the reason it happens is, look, you got that new drug and it was definitely doing better. But then all those pesky older drugs kind of washed away the effect so that the overall survival was the same. We call this confounding by post-protocol therapy. They say that. And I say to myself, really? That's not a great explanation. Because imagine we're, I'm running a marathon and I'm selling a special energy drink and my energy drink costs $10,000. And if you drink my drink, you run the first seven miles so much faster than you otherwise would. But then you crash and you run the next rest of the marathon much slower than you otherwise would so that you finish at exactly the same time. You would tell me, why did I spend $12,000 on your energy drink for the same time? And so I think this is, not a great exam this is not a great story, but that's what people say. But is that the only reason? Is that the only reason? Hmm. I started to notice something on this figure. 398 people were at risk here. Hmm. 485 people start and 398 are at risk at six weeks. And I looked up at the curve and I drew a line and I said, at six weeks, how many people had experienced the event on Everlimus? I'd say this is 88%. Would you agree with me? 88%? That means 12% of people had the event, right? 12% had the event, and it's 398. Let's do some math. 485 people start. 12% of people have the event. That's 60 people. 485 minus 60 is 426. I should expect to see 426 at time point one, but I see 398. And that's a difference of 28 people. 
7% of people have vanished on Everlimus. Poof, they're gone. Well, what about the other arm? 177, I come up, I draw a line. I say quarter people had the event. Quarter people of 239, that's 60 people. 239 minus 60 is 179. And how many people are there? 177, it's almost the same. I only lost two people here. And that's less than 1%. In the first time interval in this study, 7% of people vanish on one arm and only less than 1% vanish on the other. Is that because they enrolled recently? How about the Everlimus? They enrolled a lot of people recently, but not the placebo. The reason that can't possibly be the explanation is it's randomized. So that should be equal in both arms. So what's the only reason why so many more people, seven times as many people, quit Everlimus arm and don't come back for the scans than the people who quit the control arm? What's the reason? Toxicity. Toxicity. It's got to be, it's got to be toxicity. And who is the person getting knocked out with toxicity? Is it the average person in the data set? Or imagine two people, a 40-year-old woman who's on no medications with hormone receptor positive breast cancer who actually does run races, or a 77-year-old woman with a little bit of heart failure who's on a little gl uh, glipizide or you know, all these things. Who's the one who's going to have Everlimus toxicity and stop coming? The old and frail person. So it's not really a randomized study anymore. In one arm, we're knocking out people, and we're averaging the good people who remain. And in the other arm, we're looking at everybody. There's an imbalance in who we're following. And so we actually recreated the curves, and I won't bore you, but I can prove to you that the entire treatment effect will vanish with different assumptions about what happens to the missing people. And perhaps the real reason why there's a PFS benefit but no OS benefit, the real reason might be there's actually no PFS benefit. There's actually no PFS benefit. It's an illusion because you knocked out the sick people from Everlimus and not in the control arm. And Everlimus could be replaced with atropine or any poison you want, and you'll get the exact same result. You just need something to weed out sick people. So this is Tito Foho. He's the one who taught me all this stuff. Mm -hmm. He was my program director of the National Cancer Institute. He used to have a nice big office, and I'd come to his office after clinic, and he had printed out all these Kaplan Meyers, and he prints it really big, and he has papers, he's like four plots, and he has all these arrows and lines on everything, and he has yarn connecting all the arrows, and I thought it was like, a, I thought he was planning some plot or something, but no, I realized he was just looking at censoring. It's nothing, nothing so scary. It's a government building after all. I was a little nervous what he was up to, but he was just looking at censoring. But Tito was getting annoyed. He said, why do I have to use a ruler? Why do I have to measure all this stuff and make guesses? Everybody knows what happened. They should just tell me how many people are censored at every time point. So he goes to David Collingridge, the editor of Lancet Oncology. He says, David, make them tell me how many people are censored. And David says, all right, let's do it. And in 2017, he adds at the bottom right here the number of people censored at every time point. He adds it right here. And so in, in the Lancet journals, they, they're the only family of journals where they report it. Nobody else does it, but you can get it right in the Lancet. And they made this change silently in 2017. And not a single person <coughs> noticed or cared. Nobody noticed and nobody cared. Okay, so there's a the change. I got the data. I don't have to use a ruler. I know exactly one person censored here. And from here to here, one person. And here, three. Exactly. So I let a few years go by, and then one day, Kate Rosen walked to my office. Was she your classmate? Not sure. Yeah, she was maybe around your time. When you, she, was an o, she was an OHSU medical student. And she walked into my office and she said, I'm looking for a research project. And I said, did you know what? I tell the story. Tito made this Lancet Oncology guy put all these numbers at the bottom. And all we got to do is we go and we like, count all these numbers and all the studies ever published in the Lancet journals. We add up all the numbers and we can get something out of that. And she said, OK, I got it. And she disappeared. Four months go by. I thought I'd lost her. I thought I'd never see her again. And that idea was gone. But then she comes back in the office and she has done it. She's added up all the numbers. And we published the paper. Censored Patients in Kaplan-Meier Plots of Cancer Drugs and Empirical Analysis of Data Sharing. A title so boring, even my own mother wouldn't hang it on the fridge. <laughs> she said, no, not this. This is in the trash. OK, but here's what we found. This is the key figure. We looked at the first time point, censoring. And we looked at, let me walk you through. This is the sample size of this study. OK, this is a 2,000-person randomized trial. This is a 200-person randomized trial. Remember, Bolero is like 600 or something. And this is, in the first time point, when there's more censoring on the intervention arm, like Everlimus, it's on this side. And when there's more censoring on the control arm, it's on this side. OK? There's imbalances. Um, and you can see a few things. One, there's one that sticks out here, one that sticks out here. 
Bolero has a 6% imbalance with a 600% sample size. The dot should be right where my pointer is, right there. But Bolero is not on this plot. Does anyone know why it's not on the plot? It wasn't published in the, yeah, this is the Lancet journals, only the Lancet journals, that's the New England Journal. So it would have been here, but it's not here. There's a weighted average to where it's slightly more draw censoring on the control arm of a study. Why is there slightly more censoring in oncology studies on the control arm? Slightly more people are, yeah, they're disappointed. They wanted to be in the intervention arm. They didn't get it, and they told you to go to hell. So what happened over here? They told you to really go to hell. They said, your control arm is such trash. I don't want your control arm. I'm going to quit 15% more than the, than, the, than the other arm. And what happened here? The drug was toxic as all hell. And they said, I don't want this drug. That's what I think is happening. If you start to lose this many people, it's not a randomized study. It's a study of 100% in one arm and 85% in the other arm, and not the 15% sick enough to drop out. And so this drug was quizartinib, and FDA did not approve it for that purpose back in the day. Enter this study. Yes? No, no, no. no sorry, he has a question in the back, yeah. Yes, we're going to publish that soon. But the answer is, if it's blinded, there's less of this. And if it's unblinded, there's more of this. Like, if you know what you're getting, you're more disappointed. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's unpublished data. Timothy, you have to do that faster. Now they know our idea. So <laughs> he's going to listen someday to the recording, and he'll say. And this will be his call to action. OK, we have that data. Yeah, we did it. We updated it all the way to the modern time with a lot more data points. There's a lot of interesting things. OK, so I was reading the New England Journal, and I came across this. Lutetium-177 PSMA for prostate cancer radionucleotide for prostate cancer. Amazing, amazing advance. And you had to have one positive PSMA lesion, no negative PSMA lesions in this trial, and they randomized 800 people, 500 got it, 200 didn't, and they got this big PFS benefit, and so good, has a ratio of 0.4, and they got an OS benefit, you know, I'm such a stickler, but even look how big this benefit is, OS, PFS, what's not to like? It's such a great study. What's the problem? I looked at this and it said, it's it's PSMA versus standard of care, standard care. Well, what the hell was standard care? Standard care could not include cytotoxic chemo, no docetaxel, no cabazitaxel, no radium-223, no immunotherapy, no olaparib, none of those drugs. I was like, well, those are kind of like all the drugs I would give. So what can you get on standard arm? Well, you're allowed to get abiraterone and enzalutamide, bisphosphonates, denosumab, radiation, and prednisone. Any dose of prednisone you want, you can get. Well, I haven't prescribed single-agent prednisone for prostate cancer because I'm not a doctor living in 1952. So I've never done that. And bisphosphonates and denosumab are good, but they don't treat the disease. They treat the bone problem. And abionenza are great drugs, except if you've had abionenza. They're great if you've never had them. But once you've had one or both, they don't work so well. In this study, of course, half of them had one, Another 40% had both, and 5% somehow had more than both. They had them twice, and they're getting it for like the third time, where we know it's not going to work. And you know what they hadn't had? They hadn't had cabazitaxel. And that to me is really weird, because before this trial was even run, we ran CARD, and CARD shows cabazitaxel is better than giving Abby or Enza if you've already had them. That's what CARD already established. So they should be getting cabazitaxel in that control arm. But they didn't. OK, I talked about the control arm quality. What happened when they ran this study, it says after the trial started, there was a high incidence of withdrawal in the control group, principally attributed to patient disappointment. After discussion with regulatory authorities, we implemented enhanced trial site education measures to reduce withdrawal. Enhanced trial site education. That sounds like what we did in Guantanamo Bay. You're like, oh, you got abiraterone? And they're like, I'm thinking about quitting. I got abiraterone and they dunk you in the water, pull you out. I think you're going to take the abra. OK, OK, I'm on the study. In fact, 56% of people dropped out of the control arm before they did this enhanced trial site brainwashing, and only 16% dropped out after they did it. OK, so you remember this paper I showed you? You remember this figure I showed you? Well, this wasn't a Lancet paper, so I don't have it on this plot, but I've added it to the plot. This is where it is. It's so far off the charts. This is where it is, vision trial. It's not a randomized study. Like, I actually think Lutetium 177 PSMA is very active. It works. It's a decent drug. Uh, but it's not a randomized study when half the people on the control arm quit. And that's not going to be the person 
who takes this drug in, say for instance, Chile, where if they didn't participate in the study, they have no other product. It's gonna be the person at MSKCC who gets randomized to Abby, and they say to hell with this study, I want cabazitaxel, you know? It's gonna be selected based on socioeconomics and all these things. It's gonna undo randomization. Okay, so anyway, they said that, well, we can't give cabazitaxel because they're too sick, but of course, the control arm gets it afterwards, so they're not that sick, you know? And we wrote this video on this topic, and then we published this paper about problems with vision. All right, so those are some of the things I look at. Mm -hmm. So back to my slides at MRD. So the reason I think it was problematic is, number one, it's not unmet medical need. Um, you know, the survival outcomes are good. Number two, there's so many regimens already available. Number two, if they allow this, they can, then the sky's the limit, everything is accelerated approval. Number three, we're already adding the drugs before we have data. Number four, um, unsafe drugs come to market, it takes time to find the safety signals, like teclistimab. PFS does not have a good correlation coefficient. You know, it's very poor. Surrogacy is always at the trial level, not the individual level. Most of the variability is not captured. The post-progression treatments in myeloma are so bad that anything you think you know about myeloma is really up for grabs. We all say three is better than two. That's only in many, many studies where the two drug regimen did not get appropriate post-protocol care. We all say four is better than three. That's only in a study, Perseus and, and Cassio, and, uh, um, Andromeda, which is Videra VMP, Andromeda. Uh, that's only in the setting where they're not getting appropriate post-protocol care. We know very little in myeloma. We have a, a thousand randomized trials in myeloma. We don't know the best initial treatment. We don't know who should get a transplant. We don't know what maintenance should be. And we have all these misconceptions because they're not been run correctly. I think not even one has been run correctly. Okay. This is why this is such a bad figure. This means that if the FDA is saying, we'll give the accelerated approval for MRD, but if there's an overall survival decrement or loss, we'll pull the approval. But they don't have the ability to say that because that's only in the context of bad post-protocol care. So you could have a real decrement in the US, but you miss it in the trial because the control arm is getting nothing on the back end. So that's a very misleading statement by FDA. They're completely wrong. If you're listening, Rick, you're wrong. You're completely wrong. It's very dangerous. So that means we could actually be in a situation where we're approving more and more drugs, but survival is getting worse. We don't even know it. And the biggest problem, of course, is the safety because you're taking people with such a long time horizon and putting them under tremendous risk. And you, maybe you'll get the same result if you sequenced it. And teclistimab is not a fun drug to be on. You take teclistimab two years, you're getting infected with things that normally infect like shrubs. You need BCMA. I mean, you need it for a reason. Okay, outcomes are good. All right, and finally, the final point, I didn't tell FDA, but the real truth is, everybody was saying, patient advocate groups were saying, this is about access. If you don't allow these accelerated approval, you don't give us the access to the drugs. Well, let me ask you something. Do we have access to teclistimab? Yes. Talquetamab? Yes. Uh, uh, CAR-T? Yes. They're all FDA approved for relapsed refractory tumors. If I'm a wealthy businessman who flies on my jet to Dana-Farber, and I say, I'd like to make a donation to the Dana-Farber Institute so that you can continue to Photoshop Western, I mean, continue to do hard-hitting science, hard-hitting science here. Um, I'm gonna make a donation of a few million dollars. And I also have a few million just sitting over here. Would you give me CAR-T in the frontline setting? C could the doctor legally give CAR-T in the US? The answer is yes. We have no restriction on off-label prescribing. You can give anything you want if they'll pay for it. The reason we don't give CAR-T in the frontline is one, people may not want it, and two, um, no insurance company will pay for it. Nobody will pay for it. The FDA is presenting that MRD for accelerated approval means access, like we'll give you, we'll let the drug on the market. That's not the case. Every single drug that will come through this pathway, mark my words, will already be approved in the relapse setting. This is about funding. The whole purpose of the regulatory strategy is to compel the insurance company, force them to pay. It's about the money, it's not about the access. The whole thing is like a ruse. It's like disingenuous and dishonest in my opinion. The whole discussion is about forcing insurance companies to pay for these drugs up front, not about giving you access. If you want, you can get whatever you want up front. There's somebody who will do it. There's always been some, if you don't believe me, go to Arkansas. <laughs> in myeloma, they've been doing crazy things in Arkansas for 25 years. Okay, ASCO abstracts. All right, how much time we got? Oh good, finally. I cut so much that it's gone well. Um, you know, whenever I look at ASCO abstracts, often before I even see the result, I know what's a problem. Here's a few I picked. Let's do Laura. They're gonna present Laura tomorrow morning. You know, Laura study. It's, uh, 
It's osimertinib in people with stage three, stage three B non-small cell lung cancer, randomized control trial, they get concurrent chemo RT or sequential chemo RT. Um, they get uh, two to one randomization, OSI versus placebo, they follow you out in time, blah, 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 blah. They're gonna say, 100% believe that there's got, they got the PFS or DFS benefit here. It's gonna be very big. Everyone's gonna be clapping, 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 clapping. What do you think happened to the placebo patients on this study when they progress? What do you think happened? What should they have gotten? 100%. It should have gotten awesome maritime. What do you think the answer is going to be? Let's see. I don't know the answer. If I put money on it, I'm going to bet 50%. That's my guess. And that is an unacceptable, unethical study. Will the discussant mention that? Question mark. We'll see. OK. That's what I see. That's my guess. OK. Next thing to look for. Did they get PET CT and brain MR at baseline? If you're running a stage 3B study and you can afford awesome maritime, what can you also afford? MRI brain and PET CT. And if you can't afford MRI brain and PET CT, you sure as shit can't afford osimertinib. So you have to get this. Here's why. If you're 3B and you have brain mets, are you 3B anymore? No, you're 4. If you're 3B and you have a tiny met in the belly, are you 3B? You're 4. If you don't do this staging, you're going to have stage 4 patients in this study. Stage 4 patients already benefit from osimertinib. So if you enrich a trial 3B, call it 3B, but it's really 4, you're tricking the audience. So let's look for that. I, I, don't, I, I bet they won't even say it in the presentation. If I were to bet money, they won't even mention it. And I bet the discussant won't mention it. That's my guess. What is the rate of patients not progressing? How many people are getting this unnecessarily? What's the rate of crossover? That's what I want to know. OK. And PFS events, I also want to know where they're recurring and when they're recurring. Are they recurring again in the chest, or are they recurring distantly? I want to know what's the breakdown of the PFS composite event. They don't always report that. OK. Um, I'll skip that one. Oh, well, this is another classic example. This is a uh, uh, trastuzumab durix tcan in HER2 low metastatic breast cancer, destiny breast 6. The control arm is investigator choice, but you're not allowed to get anthracyclines. You know, there's a restricted choice. Um, and I also want to know how many of them got anthracycline in the adjuvant setting, because anthracycline is a very powerful drug in breast cancer. And HER2 low, really, what are we talking about with low? There's something called nested and adjacent subgroup analysis. We've got some papers on. I'll skip that. And about censoring. OK. I'll skip the palliative care one. I'll skip. Oh, this was already presented. I put a video out before, but you know, this was presented. <coughs> Sacituzumab, govitecan versus docetaxel, you know, uh, evoke one. Did not meet the primary endpoint of overall survival. I bet people were going to spin it. We were worried people would spin it. And then they're saying a numerical improvement in overall survival. You know, that's what I saw, a trend, numerical improvement, this kind of language. I think that's misleading. It's a stone cold negative study. <coughs> All right, I'll stop that. What else I got for you? Oh, this is a good one. Proton versus photon in head and neck cancer. OK, this is coming on the 4th of June. What's this today? Today is the 3rd. Today's the 1st. Oh, this is coming out in a few days. Wow, that's really bad billing. Um, the primary endpoint is PFS at three years. This is a non-inferiority study. The margin is 1.535. Okay, a margin means how much worse one can be than the other, and we'll still say it's non-inferior. A margin is basically like a parallel park in your car, and the margin is how big the space is. If the margin is very small, 1.05, 1.03, .05, that means you can parallel park a car in a spot that's about the same size as the car. I lived in the city for 10 years, I got good at it. If the margin is this, that means you can parallel park a car in a spot big enough to fit a school bus. I mean, this is really permissive. It means it could be way worse, and you're still getting claiming non inferiority. OK. Oh, I showed you this. All right. All right. Uh, the final conclusion, and then we'll take questions, whatever you want to talk about. OK. The fundamental problem with this conference and with this whole thing is that there's not enough debate and critical appraisal. I think that's the fundamental problem. And I call it the problem of the painter and the judge, which is that there are many people in this space who are painters, that they have products they want to advance, they're painting paintings. And that's great. We can have a contest, a painting contest, but the judge has to be someone different than the painter. It has to be a different person judging than a painter. If a painter is judging their own painting, my painting is going to look great. Okay, but we have a system where the judges are the same as the painters. 
that the design and conduct of the study, the control arm, the choice of the control arm, is really being made by the company that, needs a po that benefits from a 0.04. And the more power you give to the person who wants the positive result, the more you will naturally play the games of drug dosing, which I didn't talk about enough, but you, you know, d imbalances in censoring will be overlooked and control arm quality will be overlooked and post-protocol care will be overlooked. I think the other problem is that I don't think anyone's providing unbiased information. I don't think FDA and NCCN or ASCO. I think um, every one of us have to be a better reader of the literature in order to make progress, I think, in, in this space. Um, so if you like this talk, I recommend this book, which has a lot of these ideas and some ideas I didn't talk about. Uh, I run the YouTube channel. There's a video series on how to read and appraise clinical trials or just the cancer trials. We, host, we have Sensible Medicine, this like newsletter for anybody in medicine. It's not just oncology, it's mostly not oncology. Drug Development Letter is mostly oncology. This is one that Timothy, Olivier, and I run. Uh, I have my own Observations and Thoughts substack where I put random thoughts out. Plenary Sessions, a podcast that some of you have heard. And you can contact me either on in Instagram or LinkedIn. Uh, you can add me. I'm on both. And uh, I think that's it. All right, what do you want to talk about? Thank you all for coming. Yeah. So we got good time today. All right. Yes. So why do you think there's so many painters and not much judging? Or like why there's not independent judging? Yes. I think, I don't know. I mean, a few reasons. One is that I think, mm, like, as a fellow, like nobody teaches fellows how to read the clinical studies. Um, I go to so many journal clubs and I think I very rarely see anything insightful or something. I, to be honest, I've, I often, I, it's very rare that I ever hear anything that I haven't heard before at this conference or any place. Like I've been going to these conferences, this is my 12th year at ASCO. And uh, I often hear the same ideas and the same things said over and over again. Um, I think we would benefit more from letting more people talk who have different points of view and letting them flesh it out, more debates, more dialogue. We benefit more from training people to be more critically in tune to appraising the articles, which that's why I did all the podcast and the video. I think it has gotten better since I started. You know, when I started the podcast in 2018, I don't think, literally no one was talking about these issues. Now I see Mani is working on it and there's, there's people in Europe are working on it. There's like other people working on control arm quality and there's all these different movements and Esmo's adding the stuff that's in my book to the scale, you know, so I think it's gaining. But I think it's lack of knowledge is one. And then the other thing is like ease. Like, to be honest, if you are an oncologist and you want to have a career in oncology, doing this is the harder way to do it than I think, like, being critical of literature is harder than just going with the flow. The other thing is, like, you know, my, the side thing is I said in the beginning, I don't like to see one cancer. I find that, like, I, I, I find that very boring. But we have, like, a left kidney cancer doctor and a right kidney cancer doctor now. And that's also part of, it's easy. It's easy to just, Sloan Kettering has a doctor that only does EGFR literally only the EGFR. I mean, it's easier to know a lot of the studies if you're just that narrow, but you lose the perspective of the whole field. I think that's a problem. So I think we do need more generalists. And I do think it's a lot easier to go with the flow and just to say Crown is great and, you know, I don't know. If you look at like the ASCO influence thing, it would be interesting to kind of quantify how many times there's any critical feedback said by any of the ASCO featured voices or anything. I would venture to say it's probably zero. Um, all the non-featured voices are the ones giving the criticisms. Yeah, there's definitely a push for like prestige. Yes, prestige. There's so much running for these medications, right? Because yes, it's billions, billions. billions. Don't be, don't, nobody, don't, it's not nobody drugs to be judged. Yeah, like Pembro's 50 billion. And I mean, even, even some these drugs are like at least 10 billion life cycle. Yeah. yeah. Okay, question? Um, so you mentioned things about like how like, you have a p-value of 0.04. It's significant. You have 0.06. It's Yes, yes, yes. It has progressed, right? How can we better have like, definitions for like, significance and progression that prevent people from wanting to pee after? To, like, yeah, good. Very good question. Okay, so what is, well, one reason, like, I guess people forget. Why do we even use frequent statistics and the p-value? Okay, there's another type of statistic called the Bayesian statistic. The Bayesian statistic is you put a pretest probability. You're like, look, I'm in the pancreas cancer business. And to be honest, most drugs don't work. The pretest probability this drug works is like, let's just say 1%. And then I get all this evidence that the drug might work. And I say, the post test probability post this trial is, okay, I'm going to start at 1%. Now I'm at like 85%, which is great. Or I'm still at 22%. That's a type of statistical method that requires a lot of computing power. 
okay? But they didn't have computers in 19 diggity. And because they didn't have computers, they couldn't do the sort of Bayesian calculations, and they used something called frequentist statistics. It's statistics you can do with tables from books without a calculator. I mean, that's, really the, that's a real fundamental reason we use p-values. It comes because we didn't have a computer. And then what is the p-value? The p-value is basically saying, I'm putting my hand, I'm asking, I put my hand in a jar of Skittles twice. One time I get seven yellows, and the next time I get 12 yellows. My question is, how likely is it that I would have that result, or a more extreme result, instead of seven and 12, I would get six and 14, you know, by putting my hand in this jar twice, how likely is that to have happened under the null assumption that I put my hand in the same damn jar? That's all it is. It's saying, if you sampled from the same population, how likely did you see this or something more extreme? And 5% of the time tells you that, okay, kind of unlikely that you'd see this or something more extreme, kind of unlikely, but you know what really says unlikely is 0.0005. That says like, oh wow, only five in a thousand times or five in 10,000 times you'll see this or more extreme results, okay? So one thing people have proposed is to shift the p-value cutoff from 0.05 to 0.005, which is a proposal in I think JAMA from about five years ago. That still doesn't solve the problem because bias is so potent that you can get extreme p-values, not based on the, the, the question of interest, but based on the fact that these results, like, let me, let me put it another way. Um, uh, in polo, even if the p-value had a million zeros, I would gladly concede to you, I believe that the PFS result in polo is not due to chance, but it doesn't mean it's due to Olaparib, it doesn't mean it's a good drug and we should do it, because the gate trial is being gamed in other ways, right? So I know Olaparib had, doing something that, you know, th there's a different scene in that study that is not attributable to chance variation. What I have no idea is whether or not Olaparib is better than 5-FU maintenance, which is what I would have done, right? Okay, so that's that part, and, okay, yeah? Oh, yeah, I guess like my question yes. is, when we're designing like a system on how we want to evaluate, oh, this study is significant, this isn't, this is this, this isn't, how can we like design these uh, criteria in a way that we could have, like, we disincentivize like, people trying to change their methods to get a, a higher p I see. to get a higher progression? I mean, the only way to do that is that, um, like in the current system, the drug company goes to the FDA with a packet of information and $3 million cash. That's a user fee. The only way to really disincentivize it is to go to the FDA with the pill in the, bo in the, the, the bottle and a bottle of placebo and give, not the FDA, but some third party agency, 30 million, to design it. You just have to have, the person who designs and runs the study has to be absolutely have no stake in the outcome. I mean, otherwise it will always be gamed, like I will change the dosing and things like that. That's part of it. But the PFS question is interesting. I bet using technology and, and you could find different PFS cutoffs like size of tumor differences that better predict overall survival. That's not been explored as much as it could. But if you had access to a very big data set, you could say maybe in some tumors, 40% does have OS prediction, you know, rather than the arbitrary 20%. That's never been studied. Yes? Um, what would you say, that is there a, uh, an industry-sponsored trial in the recent five years that you think is uh, fairly designed and is, is accurate? And, no bias? No bias. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, I mean, there are definitely some no bias studies that I like. Rathel, but no, Rathel's not industry sponsored. Uh, Prodige, I think is good, not industry sponsored. Industry, <laughs> yeah, industry sponsored. I mean, two things can be true. The industry, like, the industry has, I mean, many of the drugs are great. Like, trastuzumab can is a great drug, but the trial still has gaming. You know, so part of the effect is the drug and gaming, but it's still a great drug. Lutetium-177 is a good, it's a good drug. It probably would've won if you had a fair control arm, too. Um, but almost all the trials are gamed. There, there's, there's definitely some, let me try to think. Solo 1, Olaparib and uh, PARP inhibition in ovarian cancer? That uh, has a problem, it has a problem. Timothy and I wrote a paper, I think the problem in Solo 1 is that, you know, FDA withdrew Olaparib's indication for people with four plus lines of therapy because the meta-analysis of four plus, you know, remember originally, PARP inhibitors in BRCA mutation, pancreas, in BRCA mutation ovarian cancer were approved in latter lines of therapy. In the pooled meta-analysis of latter lines of therapy, there's an overall survival harm. There's a decrement, okay? So FDA has withdrawn the approval of PARP inhibitors for four plus lines of therapy. When they ran Solo 1 in all the upfront maintenance studies of PARP inhibitors and ovarian cancer, the control arm here was crossed over to Olaparib, a place in which we know there's a deleterious OS signal. So that actually forces us to revisit the question of whether our maintenance is better than never getting it at all. All right, so that's one that we wrote a paper on that. But I would say, um, I don't know. Uh, okay, Keynote 189. I got it. Keynote 189, Pembro Platinum, lung cancer, Lena Gandhi. Just a clear winner. Subgroup analysis is clean. For me, I use Pembro Platinum for anybody 
from zero pd one all the way to 90. And then I use Pembro only for 90 and up. There's the other keynote by Michael Recht, which was 50% and up Pembro only versus chemo. But that's just such a bullshit study because they do nested analysis. The people from 50 to 80 are probably not deriving benefit from Pembro. They're actually being harmed by not getting chemo. And the benefit is driven by like over 89 and 90. So that's the way you can sort of nest the variable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I get VRD. Oh, yeah, those are good questions. So it depends on which one. OK, so here are ones I, I'll give you a few ones that I, this is the top of my head. So polo, I, I never give a lap rib in pancreas cancer. In fact, and since I don't give a lap rib, I don't even need to know the BRCA status. It's irrelevant. Everyone get, you know, fulfirinox is the winner. If you're fit enough, you get fulfirinox. And we actually know that Nalirinox has defeated cis uh, Gemnab Paclitaxel. I also never give liposomal irino TKN because I'm not crazy wasting money. So I never do that. I never use that. Um, that's that's that, that example. The other example was, what was the other example? Dare RVD. Dare RVD, you know, I mean, I don't do it myself. I do VRD and I reserve DARA. If somebody did that, I have less of a qualm about it because I think DARA has such little toxicity, like it's not harmful. And uh, I'll talk about it with the patient. Um, sometimes, like when, before belantamab was withdrawn, I would offer belantamab, even though I, had a, like, I didn't like to offer it. So sometimes like, I'll offer things, and let me just say one principle of oncology. The goal isn't that the patient will do what you would do if you're in their shoes. It's just that they know everything that I know, and they make whatever choice they want. But sometimes they think that we just do it such a disservice to even offer them things. Um, Olaparib and polo, I think, is probably harmful, so I won't even offer that. Um, Adjuvant Aussie, I might offer it if it's like high three, you know. But if you're 1B, then hell, I mean, it's, it pains me to offer that. I also work at a place where we, we have a fixed budget. This is the point I don't make enough. We have a fixed, like we're literally providing free care at San Francisco. We, it's tax money. And a lot of people get totally free care. We have a lot of undocumented people, people who don't have insurance, and we're giving all the care for free. And every time somebody in our team prescribes these products, that's less money at the end of the year. And we're getting to the end of the year, and you're getting somebody with Hodgkin's who needs ABVD. And, the, and you're looking for the money. You're getting somebody who just needs VRD, and you're looking for, I mean, we're running low on budgets. So like, that to me is also a reason why we, like people who work in the Netherlands and other places in Spain and in Germany, you have to be a little bit more thinking about that. Um, so, okay, for another example is, what about Athena, brintuximab at maintenance after auto? I never do that. Moskowitz study, PFS benefit, no OS benefit, hell no. But what about, okay, here's another example. Ibrutinib versus BR, frontline CLL. Okay, they got a PFS benefit, they don't have OS, um, and ibrutinib is given indefinitely, and BR is a fixed course. And everyone has switched over to BTK inhibitors. They're probably giving acalabrutinib or whatever, frontline CLL. I like to have a discussion, and I like to say, look, you could either do B BTK inhibitor frontline, I'm happy to prescribe it, maybe acalabrutinib has less atrial fibrillation than ibrutinib, but maybe ibrutinib is fine for a lot of people. We could talk about that. Or if you really want to do a fixed course and then just get maybe a three-year PFS, save the ibrutinib for later, and you know, you'd be surprised. You do that at a county hospital and some people on the down and out, they're like, you know what, I don't wanna be taking a pill forever. I, I can't manage that in my life. I just do the BR or whatever and then I go to that. So sometimes I do it that way. Oh, I'll give you one great example. I, we were, I used to work at the VA as attending and as you know, dose adjusted our epoch was tested against RCHOP in the CLGB study by Nancy Bartlett and their dose adjusted our epoch failed to have, an, oh, failed to have a benefit over RCHOP on PFS and OS. Like dosage to EPOC is not better than our CHOP for all comer DLBCL. But yet everybody still gives dosage to EPOC for MIC rearranged or double hit. Okay. Dosage to EPOC at the VA system, we don't send people with a pump. We bring them in and admit them for a week so they can get it. And all of my colleagues, I think, would just say, oh, MIC rearranged, must get EPOC. MIC rearranged, must get EPOC. I'm like, one, you have no randomized data for that claim. Two, you have a cross trial comparison that has extreme biases. Three, it's not your choice, it's the patient's choice. So I go to the patient and I say, listen, you're from Crescent City, California. You're driving seven hours to come here. You gotta spend a week here. You could come here every few weeks and get dose to start EPOC. And most of the people in lymphoma who are the big experts, they will say that's better. Technically speaking, they have no data to support that claim that it's better. We could give you our CHOP in a hospital near you. You don't have to drive here. And maybe the risk is a theoretical loss of efficacy, that there's less cure rate. What do you want to do? And I will say 100% of the time, near 100% of the time, they say, are you kidding? I didn't even know that was an option. I don't want to drive here. So far, my dog, my lot, you know? And so people choose our CHOP, which is ironically what I would choose if I was in that situation. You know? So, like, so I believe in giving the choices like that. But 
I think you have to present it in a certain way. Yes? yes I have a question returning to the crossover yes. issue, especially in the era of monitor targeting everything else. Like for example, in the American trial, the green track cancer, initially they had planned studies to do the targeting of that cancer, but they didn't want to do it in the Just like code break, code break two hundred. So Torosib did the same thing. Yeah, go on. And you know, the reason for which they, they it was a bit of the patient associations demanded this uh, change. So how, how do you, even if a, a cleaner design would have been primary and front of OS, yeah, with no crossover, how, yeah, how do you, yeah, I, I don't, know, how do you fix the situation? Yeah. A few thoughts. One is I favor cleaner designs. Look at Cobrick 200. Cobrick 200 is Sotorosib versus Docetaxel. You had crossover from Docetaxel to Sotorosib. They downgraded the sample size from, and they made OS to PFS. And all these changes is Sotorosib could actually be, have a shorter OS than Docetaxel and it's all being confounded. Um, I think you have to run the clean studies. The clean study should be run in the latter lines. This trial is a frontline study, isn't it? No, it's a second line study. So I think the way to solve that is go to the third line, go to the fourth line. You know, you don't even have to go, why do you have to go second line? What's the, pro, what's the name of the drug product? Uh, Ibocidinib. Ibocidinib. And you, you have to have a mutation to be in it, IDH? IDH. You have to IDH mutation, breast cancer? Uh, in biliary tract. In biliary tract cancer. Oh gosh, really? They crossed everyone over? That's terrible. We, don't, we need a clean study of IDH here in biliary tract cancer. It was approved based on response rate and it's being given. I think that's a, that's a great example. I would have banned, a uh, crossover should not be given. They should have done a clean study first. Now let's talk about the patient groups. I 100% believe that we should listen to patients. I 100% believe the way we're doing that is totally wrong. Here's what it means to listen to patients. Everybody on a clinical trial should get a video camera and record their weekly experience on the drug. And when you go to the drug advisory meeting, you should play a random video, 10 random videos from the pile of videos. So you play the video of somebody who's doing well and the video of somebody who is dead. The people who come to the ODAC to testify are never the people who are dead. Their experience is lost. We don't know about them. People with toxicity, we don't know about them. People who are poor, people who don't want to come, people who don't want to participate in patient advocacy groups, they don't come. There's very little data, but I would strongly suspect that patient advocates, particularly at this conference, are higher socioeconomic status, much more likely to have PhD and doctorate level education, much less likely to be black and Hispanic. I mean, we're, the patient advocates, patient advocates telling us what patients want are not the average patient. They're a very select subgroup of people with indolent biology who have attributed their success to being on trials, and it's not the same as the average lung can small cell lung cancer patient who's dead in three months or four months. The way we do this is a disservice. So I think we should be collecting all this data prospectively, asking people on this study, and I personally say the other problem is the patient groups, where's the funding come from? Where's the patient group that has impartial funding? Every single patient advocate at the ODAC on MRD testified that the product should be approved. Their organizations receive millions from the company. So my answer for patient groups is I want to know what the average patient thinks, and I think that NIH should fund studies to do that, video diaries of anybody in the study, and the final point, who's not on the study? The study is not everybody. The study is just a tiny fraction of people in your clinic, but if your bilirubin is too high and your creatinine is too high, et cetera, et cetera, you're not on the study. That means the study results are only extrapolatable to the people on the study, and we, we have a lot of uncertainty about how much they benefit people off the study. And so what I would do, in that situation is I think trials should be more pragmatic and enroll more people. It's so interesting to me that ivocidinib has crossover, but Adora and Laura do not have crossover. It's so ridiculous, right? Ivocidinib is a very marginal drug, and it, you know, it's not very durable in biliary tree IDH inhibitor. Yeah? So my question is also related to crossover. So um, for, for example, for those post-marketing trials, yes. which are based on the accelerated approval, yes. and <laughs> well, I mean, depends on who you ask. So one thing is like um, the current FDA logic is we'll give accelerated approval in a ladder line of therapy based on response rate, and we will ask for a confirmatory study to be run in an earlier line of therapy, often based on a different surrogate, typically PFS. The FDA typically does not ask for OS data at any time point, particularly like in myeloma, I think all the frontline approvals were made in the absence of OS data at the time of approval. They're based on PFS in the frontline and whatever tumor you want. Breast cancer too with the uh, uh, P3 kinase inhibitor with alpha-lysib, et cetera. Um, uh, 
There is a drug that just got FDA approved, what is it, tarlatamab, okay, for small cell lung cancer based on response rate. Sample size of the study is what, like 180-ish? And the study took about two years to run, okay, because you have to give the drug to 180 people, and then you have to wait for response, and then you have to measure the median duration of response after that. You have to wait for the median duration of response. In these latter line settings, it's actually faster to run a randomized study, tarlatamab versus physician choice. Because as you randomize, you can be ascertaining overall survival all along. So I guess if I were really in charge of FDA, I would dramatically reduce res approvals in the latter lines based on response rate. I would dramatically increase randomized trials in the, in the latter line. I don't think you save time. In fact, we have a paper by Emerson Chen and I where we prove mathematically that you don't save time in multiply refractory settings. And then once you establish benefit in the latter line, I will ask for trials to test early versus delayed administration of the product. Yeah, that's my principle. That's in the book you like it. Yes? Um, uh, another question. Uh, so um, in that adjuvant setting of melanoma, there yes. are several trials, the therapy trials, yes. and the Gabbard primary trial. Yes. And um, the only keynote trial, or the only trial that had crossover was the keynote trial. Uh, and they never published the U.S. data, yeah, even though they, they did the crossover, but they never published This it. is the Alex Egamont paper? Alexander Egamont? Yeah, but okay, Pembro versus, yeah, yeah, Pembro Pembro versus, versus placebo, uh, placebo they had the stage three. They never published the U.S. data. Yeah. It still, and to my knowledge, has not shown OS benefit. They did a PNS2 paper, though. I know, yeah. they did a PNS2 paper. Yeah. They did a PNS2 paper. Yeah. 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 Ye